I really appreciate that. And uh, welcome to Angel Island State Park. I am broadcasting from North Garrison of uh, Fort McDowell. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alan Allensworth was stationed here at the beginning of the 20th century. And he's an extremely important historical figure in California history and United States military history, African-American history. He was the highest ranking black officer in the uh, United States Army during the beginning of the 20th century and the first African-American man to make the uh, rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, he was stationed here from 1900 to 1902 at the West Garrison of Fort McDowell, which used to encompass all of Angel Island. Uh, during the Civil War, that particular location was called Camp Reynolds. And its history uh, actually dates back to the American Civil War, established in 1863, and as part of the coastal defenses of San Francisco Bay during the American Civil War. Um, Alan Allensworth uh, was a combatant in the American Civil War as well. He was born in 1842 and was born into slavery in Kentucky and actually escaped slavery to join the war, join the war effort. He joins the Union Army as a civilian in the hospital corps as a nurse's aide. He later joins the Union Navy as an extremely uh, uh, well-decorated and uh, renowned soldier and a uh, uh, military figure within the Union Army during the Civil War. After the Civil War, during Reconstruction, he begins his career in the field of education and in theological research and preaching. Uh, during Reconstruction, he joined a, the Freedmen's Bureau uh, school system. Freedmen's Bureau was uh, established to assist African-Americans who've been emancipated and were suffering uh, economic hardship and uh, social deprivation, such as lack of education, Freedmen's Bureau created a system of schools. And uh, Allensworth, after he uh, retired from the military service, he, uh, he became a teacher in um, actually in Kentucky, in a town called Christmasville. Uh, he would very soon after become a Baptist minister and he would be involved in the Baptist church's education system. He's uh, named superintendent of schools for the, um, uh, Sunday schools for the Kentucky Baptist Church system. I, I'd like to share with you a few images that pertain to that specific time period, the American Civil War, out of which uh, Colonel Allensworth emerges. Uh, very interesting and important historical figure here at Angel Island and actually in a number of other uh, locations in California, specifically the park system. And here's actually a portrait I did of Lieutenant Colonel Allensworth. Uh, this is him actually in front of the schoolhouse at the township of Allensworth, which he would later uh, plan and assist in the foundation of. Uh, the township is named after him. Uh, he had long had in mind the idea of establishing a colony and an educational uh, institute that would serve African-Americans in the uh, in the early 20th century, but this would be after he would leave the army. This uh, township wasn't founded until 1908. It's kind of in the twilight of his life, but the prominent building, uh, prominent structure in the township is the schoolhouse, which is built in 1912. He had served in a variety of capacities. Public service was kind of a reoccurring theme in Alan Allen's life. As I said, he was an educator. He would travel throughout Reconstruction era South, American South and the West. And he was uh, establishing educational institutions and speaking on matters that were of uh, significance to the African-American community at the time and later became a political leader. He was actually elected to serve in the Republican National uh, Convention in 1880 and 1884 as a delegate from the state of Kentucky. So he was a uh, had a distinguished political career, but he also understood that uh, the needs of his people uh, extended into the army where uh, various all African-American military units were operating. Some, and the origins of that actually go back to the American Civil War, which I'd like to discuss uh, momentarily here. Uh, this is actually an illustration that I did of uh, Martin Delaney who was another early uh, advocate for African-American soldiers during the American Civil War. 
uh, he he was he was very insistent and persistent in his advocacy for African American troops to participate in the war effort against the uh, Confederate rebellion and for emancipation. So he was uh, he was a, he was an early advocate and uh, and he was um, he was an officer for the 50, 54th Massachusetts Infantry, which was an all African-American uh, colored unit that uh, was deployed in various engagements against the Confederacy. And he won enormous renown during the war. Along with that, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Congressman Robert Smalls, who had actually also served in the Union uh, military during the Civil War and was an advocate for African-American troops. He too had escaped from slavery and he had actually stolen a Confederate ship, driven or navigated this ship across enemy lines and turned it into the Union military forces, the Union Navy specifically. And after the war was over, he became a prominent Reconstruction era politician and advocated for the, uh, for the needs of African-American troops that stayed in military service after the war was over. So these military units were specifically, uh, well, later were known as the Buffalo Soldiers. So this is 1866, after the Civil War is over with, these uh, four African-American military regiments, army regiments, the 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiment and the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiment are formed and mostly serve in the American Western Frontier. And that's why I drew up this map. I wanted to talk about various locations, various uh, areas of uh, historical significance that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, I'm actually up here in San Francisco Bay, Fort McDowell. Uh, Camp Reynolds is the specific location on Angel Island that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alan Allensworth was operating out of. And it's connected, it's, uh, it's in San Francisco Bay, and the headquarters was in the Presidio of San Francisco, which is where the Buffalo Soldiers had originally sailed into in uh, 1899 for their military service in the California uh, uh, public lands. So you have Presidio of Monterey, which is another port of entry for the Buffalo Soldiers on their patrols. You have Yosemite Valley, Sequoia Kings uh, Canyon. It's a national park, but that had uh, been under the bureaucratic control of the uh, United States Army before the national park system is officially organized. And below you have uh, Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park, which is originally the colony or township of Allensworth. It's in the Central Valley, in the southern part of the Central Valley here in California. It was largely an agricultural community, but uh, Alan Allensworth had in mind that it would eventually become a, uh, an educational institute akin to that of uh, Tuskegee in Alabama. So these are all, uh, all important historical sites and they're all connected by the fact that they were patrolled, uh, garrisoned, and uh, largely built up by two of the Buffalo Soldier Regiments. These are all African-American military uh, groups that are formed in the aftermath of the American Civil War. So one such group is the 9th Cavalry, which later would be commanded by the first African-American military superintendent of a national park. That would be uh, uh, Colonel Charles Young. But the other, the 24th Infantry, were the Buffalo Soldiers to which uh, Colonel Allensworth would be attached. He would be the chaplain. He would serve as a, uh, as a, a religious leader and instructor for Buffalo Soldiers that were stationed here in California. So he rejoins the Army in 1886 with an officer's commission and becomes chaplain for the 24th Infantry. And they begin their California expedition in 1899. Some of them are stationed right here at Angel Island. And I wanna show you, uh, unfortunately, I, we can't go over there today. Uh, broadcasting from there, it's very difficult because uh, the Wi-Fi connection at that side of the island is, uh, is um, inconsistent and sometimes we break out and it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but I do have some video footage of that specific part of the park so you can have an idea of what it looks like. I'm gonna show you some, uh, some video of that right now. Bear with me one moment. And actually, if you could turn up your volume, uh, the sound quality is a little bit different from the broadcast that I'm doing right now, but 
allow you to do that one moment here. Right now, which had been the home of Alan Allensworth between the years 1900 and 1902. Right behind me is a portrait of the Colonel who had been the chaplain for the 24th Infantry Buffalo Soldiers who were stationed here at Camp Reynolds and Angel Island during that specific time period. And I'm standing in front of Quarters 10, the building we were just in. I was showing you a portrait of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Allen Allensworth himself, and he'd lived inside of this house. But if you look over here, you'll see additional uh, housing. This is also for officers that were stationed here at uh, Camp Reynolds. And we're right above the uh, parade grounds, which uh, there would have been additional structures over here. There would have been uh, barracks for the enlisted men. Troops would have stood in formation over at this uh, parade ground area. Down below, you'll see the, uh, the quartermaster. That brick building was put up in 1908, has a commanding view of the Golden Gate. And over here, to my left, you'll see Officer's Row. And these are all uh, wooden structures that would have housed uh, the officers who would have been here at this garrison, West Garrison of Fort McDowell, Camp Reynolds. And then as we pan further, you'll see, uh, you'll see the other side of Quarters 10 and the Army Bakery, which we call the Bakehouse, which is uh, where uh, Army troops would have, uh, would have baked bread for the purposes of the troops that were stationed here at the post. And as you can see behind me, you'll see the chapel of Camp Reynolds, St. Marie. And this had been the chapel in which uh, Lieutenant Colonel Allen Allensworth would have conducted his services. Let's have a closer look at the facility right behind me here. And we're standing directly in front of uh, the uh, Camp Reynolds Chapel in adjacent schoolhouse. The building was originally erected in 1876, and it was used for both religious purposes and also for educational purposes. So this is the facility in which uh, Lieutenant Colonel Allensworth would have uh, delivered his religious sermons and also his wife, uh, Josephine Lavelle Allensworth, would have played the organ and uh, they would have had their, uh, had their ceremonies and ed ed educational instruction, first through third grade for the soldiers and for the children of the post. And we're at the back of the Camp Reynolds Chapel and Schoolhouse. Over here you can see the rear of the facility and the historic swing set that's directly behind the old schoolhouse. I just want to show you, uh, share with you oh, sorry, one sec. I just want to share with you what the, uh, what the landscape of that specific area looked like. Uh, that's what it looks like today. Fortifications and the encampments would have looked a little bit different during the beginning of the 20th century. So we have some uh, illustrations I'd like to share with you that show uh, how the building sort of evolved over the years and what you, it would look like from different angles that we weren't able to get to earlier. Uh, one second here. One moment. Here's all. Well, we saw this earlier. This was uh, this was the the uh, the chapel in which uh, Colonel Allensworth would uh, deliver religious and educational instruction to the various uh, soldiers that were attached to the 24th Infantry and to the children of the military post. So you had three, uh, three grades for the, or three levels of instruction for the, uh, for the attendance of his program. So it was the first through third grade and the, uh, and the emphasis of his program was to 
increase educational or in, increase uh, literacy, increase uh, arithmetic ability, which were, um, were not emphasized in military education or even what little public education was available at the time, as Allensworth noted. So he made that an emphasis of his program. Every military post that he was stationed at, he would build uh, some kind of institution that would assist the soldiers and, um, and you know, various personnel that was attached to the, uh, to the garrison, uh, basic uh, uh, educa educational benefits. Literacy was uh, extremely low at the time. And this is uh, just a drawing of uh, quarters 10 from a different angle. This is the house in which Colonel Allensworth lived while he would have been here at Angel Island. Of course, he wasn't a colonel by that point in time. He was a major himself, but he would retire as a lieutenant colonel in 1906. After traveling uh, really all over the American West and actually just uh, various other countries as well, he'd been in the Philippines. Uh, here's a, an image of Camp Reynolds from below. It's more down by the water. And this is what it looks like today. This is a collection of buildings from the 1860s and 1870s. Quarters 10 and the adjacent bakery are from 1863. So those are the two oldest buildings that are still standing here at Angel Island. And uh, Colonel Allensworth would have operated uh, right around there. And this is yet another angle from the water itself. You have the quartermaster facility that goes back to 1908. So that would have been built a little bit after uh, Colonel Allensworth left this specific military installation, but it's actually the contemporary of the foundation of the township, Allensworth, that uh, he would found right after he, uh, he retired from the Army, Lieutenant Colonel. And these are portraits of the Allensworths that I, I actually drew myself. Uh, here to the left, you have uh, Josephine Lavelle Allensworth, who had been the Colonel's wife. And she was a leader and activist, uh, one of the leaders of the Allensworth colony after the death of the colonel in 1914. He died in a, uh, a motorcycle accident, actually. It's very unfortunate, but he died in Los Angeles while he was advocating, trying to raise awareness and raise funding for the uh, Allensworth community. Josephine Lavelle Allensworth had been a renowned uh, musical uh, instructor, music teacher. She'd been a renowned organist as well. And uh, she would actually perform the organ uh, during uh, the colonel's uh, uh, ceremonies and religious services. And she would also uh, assist in the educational programs, uh, continuing as an educator in the township of Allensworth where education was a top priority. So the Buffalo soldiers to which uh, Colonel Allensworth was one of the leaders were four African-American regiments that were formed by the U.S. Army in the aftermath of the American Civil War. During the Civil War itself, 200,000 Black soldiers and sailors served in the uh, Union's war effort. And they performed with such distinction that the Union generals made notice and they advocated for the formation of these uh, various uh, uh, units that would later be called Buffalo Soldier Regiments. Uh, 24th Infantry, which you can see here, uh, that, was the, uh, that was the unit that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Allensworth was the chaplain for. He was the religious leader uh, for uh, many of the Buffalo soldiers that were part of this regiment. 25th Infantry, uh, they would actually also serve with distinction in the American West. Uh, I'll actually show some images of that a little bit later, but they were actually part of an experimental cavalry uh, 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 program. Uh, riding bicycles across the uh, American West from Missouri to Montana. And we have some very interesting historical images of what that, uh, what that looked like. Buffalo soldiers mounted on bicycles, traveling across all sorts of different terrain through the American West. And you have the 9th Infantry, which is apparently uh, the first unit that had obtained the title Buffalo Soldier. So the Buffalo Soldiers were stationed in the American West and they were involved in uh, wars against various Native American peoples on the plains. Uh, one of them was the, uh, was the Cheyenne, and they had the famous dog soldiers, who apparently were so impressed by the fighting spirit of the Buffalo soldiers, the Ninth Cavalrymen, that they, uh, they compared their fighting spirit to the Buffalo. Uh, that's, that's, that's one of the uh, theories about how the name originated 
but they took such pride in that name uh, that they incorporated it into their heraldry, which you can also see here uh, in the 10th Cavalry's uh, heraldry, which is just an image of a buffalo. But yes, they were combatants against various Native American tribes, but they were also charged with protecting various Native American tribes in Oklahoma, where uh, various tribes had been relocated. Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw had been relocated, and Buffalo soldiers were assigned to protect them from uh, militias that might come in and violate their rights. And uh, it's kind of a very interesting connection as far as uh, African American history is concerned on the Western frontier is the Buffalo soldiers settling and uh, in families with uh, Native American peoples that were stationed in various areas that they were assigned to, uh, assigned to protect from a hostile environment in the case of uh, a lot of white settlers that were coming through, some of whom the uh, Buffalo soldiers uh, had to engage in military confrontations against various points. This is going back to the map that I was talking about earlier. You see the uh, Presidio of San Francisco and Presidio of Monterey is where the uh, 9th Cavalry would, uh, would sail into in 1902 before they were stationed to Sequoia Kings Canyon to uh, patrol the grounds, almost acting as law enforcement, uh, preventing illegal uh, hunting and logging from encroaching on these public lands and establishing trails some of which are still very much in use uh, to this very day. So it's a very, uh, it's a very long and interesting history that stretches all over the state of California. But some of the, uh, some of the veterans that had been attached to the 9th Cavalry would, uh, would settle down in Allensworth's uh, Agricultural and Educational um, Institution and Township of Allensworth in the Central Valley, which is about an hour, uh, hour and a half away from Sequoia Kings National Park is a closer image of the 9th Cavalry uh, heraldry. We are actually in the midst of the 150th anniversary of the Buffalo Soldiers, uh, the foundation of these units. Uh, really California's first park rangers, if you think about it, because if they were assigned to these uh, various national parks and state parks uh, before that either institution was officially bureaucratically organized, and we're operating in the role of a park ranger, both part of the law enforcement arm and the uh, trails maintenance arm of park operations. You can easily make that argument. Uh, so we acknowledge the Buffalo Soldiers as being among California's uh, first park rangers. Uh, so those are some, uh, there's a variety of uh, historical images. I'd like to share with you a few more that pertain to the legacy of the Buffalo Soldiers and of Allensworth, who had been stationed here at Angel Island in the beginning part of the 20th century, and then later founded what's now the State Park Allensworth, which is uh, named after him, which I mentioned earlier. One moment here. You see, this is at the uh, state capitol or the uh, California State Senate chambers, Buffalo Soldier Mounted Cavalry Unit and other Buffalo Soldier uh, historical reenactment groups uh, congregated in 2016 to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the foundations of these uh, post-Civil War African-American uh, Army regiments that would play such a crucial role in the establishment and the development of the uh, California State Park system. And here's a closer image of the uh, ceremonial helmet of the Buffalo Soldiers, the four regiments that I previously mentioned, 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments. This is actually an image of uh, Buffalo Soldier ceremonial attire that uh, is actually on display at the Gene Autry Museum of the American West in Griffith Park. Uh, so I was very impressed by this. I took this picture back in 2010, to the year before the Civil War sesquicentennial began. And these are uh, members of the Buffalo Soldier Mounted Cavalry Unit in full ceremonial attire. And this is a historical reenactment group that I'm actually affiliated with. And we actually we travel around to various, uh, various uh, schools, uh, events, and historical sites 
to discuss the history of these remarkable figures and uh, this part of American history. So you can see the legacy is still very much being kept alive by these various groups. And this picture is actually taken at, taken at the uh, uh, Strawberry Festival Parade in Garden Grove right at the beginning of the uh, Buffalo Soldier sesquicentennial and continues on. This is a Juneteenth. And it's, this is all kind of interconnected to the historic California Buffalo Soldier Trail, which as I illustrated in the previous map, connects various parts of the state of California and actually probably should be expanded to include some other historical sites that the Buffalo Soldiers had, uh, had traveled through during their time. And another important element of the Buffalo Soldiers that should be uh, discussed but isn't really emphasized as much is the uh, remarkable role of uh, African-American cowboys during the, uh, during the, uh, uh, the American Western frontier and the westward movement of uh, the United States. Uh, some figures I've seen have said that uh, nearly half of the cowboys in the American West were of African-American descent. But the Buffalo Soldiers uh, legacy continues beyond the uh, American West and actually goes into the Second World War. And I'd mentioned the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama that had been founded that uh, Colonel Allensworth had modeled his educational program around. They, Tuskegee is also very famous for the, uh, for the uh, U.S. Army Air Corps unit called the Tuskegee Airmen, which was uh, won many distinctions during the Second World War. So you, uh, you can also see uh, historical reenactors, docents, volunteers that discuss these, uh, these specific uh, figures and their role in American military history. It's going back to the Civil War, Civil War reenactment I attended and the discussion of uh, what, what were called colored troops during the American Civil War is an important one to be had because over 200,000 black men, African-Americans served in various wings of the, uh, United, uh, the, the Union military, mostly in the U.S. Army, but also in the uh, United States Navy, such as uh, Alan Allensworth and, uh, of course, uh, Congressman Robert Smalls, who I mentioned before. As another illustration I did at the beginning of the uh, Buffalo Soldier Sesquicentennial, uh, commemorating the 10th Cavalry uh, troopers with Buffalo Soldiers. Of course, this is my grandfather. Uh, the Army wouldn't be uh, explicitly or, or finally um, desegregated until the Korean War. So he was um, my. Well, my grandfather, Harold Yancey, he had uh, he'd served in the army during the Korean War, and this is him in his, uh, in his army uh, attire and uniform during that period in the early 1950s. So the Buffalo Soldier uh, says, I know the, the patch says 1866 to 1944, but arguably it extends a little bit longer than that uh, going into the uh, going into the 1950s, which would mean the sesquicentennial wouldn't be really over with into the uh, 2090s. But I wanted to share all these, uh, all these images with you just to give you an idea of how far reaching, how long lasting the legacy is. And to kind of make up for the fact that um, historically this has been a, uh, th these are figures that have long been overlooked. And the same thing can be said of Lieutenant Colonel Allen Allen's work. Um, as far as his impact and his, his role during this period as a leader for his people and a, and a leader actually even in national politics, as I said before, he was a, uh, he was a delegate for the Republican National uh, Convention, National Committee in uh, both 1880 and 1884. For him to become a commissioned chaplain in the U.S. Army, that had to be signed off, I believe, by President Grover Cleveland. And who was a Democrat was actually on the other side of the political aisle. So that just shows kind of how influential he was in his time. Um, and yeah, he, he ended up founding his own colony, his own uh, institute, which he had hoped would be a, uh, a broad reaching educational program, a college, a polytechnic institute where uh, African-American students could learn agriculture. They could learn business. They can learn a, a broad variety of uh, fields to gain uh, self-sufficiency and independence 
in a very hostile and racist uh, reconstruction era, and, or post reconstruction in the, in the case of uh, Allen's, the main period of historic interest is between 1900 and 1918. So we're talking the very beginning of the 20th century, but uh, Colonel Allen Allensworth would die as a result of a motorcycle accident. He was getting off a trolley and was hit by a, uh, a reckless motorcyclist. And he died in 1914 after a long career as a, uh, really, a, is in the case of Allensworth itself, the township, he was a municipal administrator. He'd been a theologian. He'd been an educator, a teacher. He'd been a Baptist minister, a distinguished Buffalo soldier, and military officer. So uh, uh, a diverse, broad career, I guess, I think you could call him a polymath of the sorts. And in his time, he had e enormous influence. When he died in 1914, uh, that would be the beginning of the decline of the township of Allensworth. Eventually a drought would hit and the town would run into uh, various economic troubles. Um, but that, that's now a state park. A lot of those buildings have been restored. Some of the original buildings are still standing and that can be visited to this, uh, to this very day. So you can, uh, you, can see the, uh, you can see the architecture, you can see where these people live, you can see what their, uh, what their lifestyle was like, what their ambitions were. And you can see images of what the town could have eventually have uh, evolved into had it not been for various catastrophic circumstances that led to the ultimate decline of the town. But that's well preserved and it's a state park and it's definitely well worth visiting as is Angel Island. So I'm going to hand it over here to John and he's going to. There's a couple of uh, annual events that the town of Allensworth is now Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park. They have the Allensworth May Festival on May 20th. These are all Saturdays. They have the Juneteenth celebration and they're doing that on June 10th, the 10th day of June for that Juneteenth celebration. They had an annual rededication on October 14th. These events are held at Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park. It is in the southern part of the California Central Valley outside of Bakersfield. It is uh, remote and in, in a great destination to visit. These events are on Saturdays. The events are from 10 to 4 p.m. And it would be great to have y'all visit the the park and see that park uh firsthand um we have been broadcasting live from angel island state park and there's a lot of history here at angel island state park from 99 years of military history 65 years of quarantine history and 30 years of immigration history as the second largest immigration station in the united states and Angel Island is in the uh, San Francisco Bay, and it'd be great to have you visit, and you need to take a ferry to get on over here. So, Dorian, do you have anything else to share? Yeah, th thanks, for, th thanks for that, John. I, I really appreciate you, you mentioning that. Uh, Angel Island, I've been working here for the past year, and I've really, uh, really grown to love this very unique location in San Francisco Bay. We're going to be heading down to Allensworth uh, actually next week, and that's going to be my new duty station for, uh, for a while. But Angel Island, there's, there's a lot to see here too. A uh, lot of layers of history. And I'd also want to acknowledge that uh, Angel Island is part of the ancestral homeland of the uh, Coast Miwok uh, tribe and linguistic group. Specifically, the Huiman Band was, uh, was inhabiting Angel Island for thousands of years. And this had been a, uh, been a settlement used for fishing and hunting and homes, um, homes and villages were built here all throughout uh, Marin County, of what, what what's now Marin County, and it's uh, it's definitely an important uh, layer of history here at Angel Island and throughout this part of California. Uh, so it's, there's there's many levels of, of history here. After uh, after the uh, the Mexican government ends up taking control of this, uh, this specific area. It becomes a rancho. And after that, the U.S. Army ends up taking over this, uh, 
specific installation before forms camp rentals. So that goes back to the Civil War, which I mentioned before. So even after or even long before any of the buildings that I showed you were established, there's a rich human cultural history here at Angel Island State Park that uh, yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely important to reflect on here. Dorian, congratulations on your promotion to being State Park Interpreter One at Allensworth. We are going to dearly miss you and having your expertise here at Angel Island. And um, this is Dorian's second to last day of on the island. And uh, well done. You, you ended uh, your season here with a hit. Um, thank you very much for joining um, this program presented with California State Parks as a ports cast. Thank you so much. Thank, th thank you for allowing us this opportunity. And uh, hopefully we'll see you here at the park. <laughs>